Wow, what an incredible year it has been here. That's just the highlights from this year. And as we are celebrating 18 years here at Crosspoint. Man, what a, what a privilege to just be used by God to impact people and to do God's work here. And so I'm honored to be here. And as always, uh, it is a privilege to share and to teach with you. My name is Pastor Paul. I'm the lead pastor here at Crosspoint. And I am just humbled by what God has done over the last 18 years. And so we are so grateful that you are here with us, that you are worshiping with us, because we get the privilege to reflect over God's faithfulness for the past 18 years today, and for us to remember that all glory and honor, it belongs to him. That what we have done and how we have done it is by the hard work of awesome people coming together and believing that God was going to do the miraculous, and he has. And so today it is only fitting that as we wrap up our message series called Be, that we're going to do it by diving into the understanding of what it means to be the church. So we're wrapping up today that message series on what does it mean to be the church. And we're doing it on our 18th anniversary, and I thought that that was awesome. So we're going to just kind of quickly recap. If you haven't been with us in person or here for the last few weeks, let me tell you about what does it mean to be the church. And what scripture tells us and the word that it is used in the Bible is ecclesia. And ecclesia is the word that it's a gathering of his people. That's the first term that is used in the entire scriptures about this thing called the church. It's the gathering of his people, but here's the reason, and here's how, right? Empowered and indwelled with his Holy Spirit to spread the good news of Jesus. That's why God created the church. That's what he used, that's why we exist, is that we are empowered and indwelled by the Holy Spirit to spread the good news of Jesus. And so we talked about what does that practically look like then for you and I to be the church, because if the church is not the building, but the church is the people, what does that practically look like? And so we had a couple of these statements, I call them the be statements, right? And the first one we talked about was be sensitive and listen to come sit with me moments in people's lives. A come sit with me moment is when somebody shares something that's going on like, hey, I'm having a hard time. I don't know how to make it through this. I'm not adjusting well to moving to the booming metropolis of Hernando County. My marriage is struggling. I don't like the new school. And as people, we're going to take that moment, we're going to be sensitive and say, well, you know what? Why don't you come sit with me and join me at church? Why don't you just come and sit with me right here at the cafeteria? Why don't you just come and sit with me and let's talk and do life together? And so that's one of the reasons why we have all these invite cards always passing out here. We're just looking for come and sit with me moments where people's lives are kind of intersecting with some hardship to where there's that moment that we can offer hope. The second thing we talked about was being engaged in the growth opportunities through the church. Being engaged in growth opportunities. Things that we had just last week with our Women's Dwell Conference. How many ladies got to be a part of that and how awesome was that? And then coming up this Friday, fight night for the fellas. You guys excited? And we kicked off our growth groups last week, and we've got some other great opportunities. One of them is called Financial Peace University. I don't know about you. I don't know if you're struggling in this economy, and you're trying to figure out how do I get my money to go further, but FPU is an awesome opportunity to just really get a handle on our finances and make them work for us instead of us working for them. We got another awesome opportunity starting up called Starting Point, which if you're new to faith and you're new in your relationship with Jesus, that's an awesome opportunity to kind of just grow in this short several week group where we gather and we just talk about what's most important now in my life that Christ is Savior. We talked about some other B things, right, about being involved through serving, that you and I are hardwired to serve. It's in our DNA. That's the way God made us. Jesus' own words were that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And we are made in his image, and we give of ourselves, our time, our talents, our treasures. We serve one another here in the church and through the ministries and in the community and missions throughout the world. And then as we wrapped up that first week, our last one, that first week of our series was to be set apart in how we live. To be set apart. See, the church is that we are to be set apart, that we don't just give Jesus lip service on Sunday, but we give him life service Monday through Saturday. 
that how I am living outside of these public gatherings is just as profound and declarative of my faith and my walk with Jesus. I'm not living some kind of double standard, hypocritical life Monday through Saturday, but what I profess on Sunday is fleshed out and in alignment Monday through Saturday. And then last week we talked about understanding and being mindful of your time. That time is a precious gift. And for a lot of people in this room, you might not realize it, but there is an end date to our lives. For some of us in this room, we're realizing that that end date is a lot closer because we got more time behind us than we got time left ahead of us. And so what am I doing with my time that is of significance? How am I investing my life? What will outlive me that I'm a part of? And we talked about being intentional to do God's work because that is the greatest thing that will outlive and transcend all of eternity is to spread and share the good news of Jesus. And then our last point last week was to be contagious. To be contagious. To not just keep this good news of what Jesus has done in my life to myself, but to be contagious, to share, to spread, and to let it go beyond us. And so today we're going to finish up with just a couple of more statements about what does it mean to be the church. Some distinctives, some characteristics that I think should mark everybody in this space today and those joining online. These are some things that when people see us, they should see in us. And we're going to dive into some scripture today. But the first one is this. This is a characteristic that I think should be befitting of every person who claims to be a follower of Jesus. Are you ready? Here's what they should be. They should be grateful. They should be grateful. In fact, Colossians chapter 3, there's some great wisdom and some great truth in here. And so we're going to turn there. If you guys have your Bibles, feel free to turn to Colossians chapter 3. That's in the New Testament. The Bible's broken up into two parts. There's the Old Testament, which was God's work from creation all the way through the prophets and preparing the way for Jesus. And then there's the New Testament, when Jesus became flesh and blood here on earth. And it's about his life, his death, his resurrection, and then the birth of the early church. And so the book of Colossians is found in the New Testament after the Gospels. And the Apostle Paul is writing to an early church in Colossae. And these are the words that he has to say in chapter 3, verses 16 and following. You can look, look up here and follow along on the screen behind me. There's a stack of free Bibles. That's our gift to you, or you can follow along on our app. But in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, it says this, Let the message of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through the psalms, hymns, and song from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father through him. Gratitude. It should mark us as believers. Gratitude, it's so important. Here, this is the thing about gratitude. Gratitude is about remembering where you came from, remembering how far you've come. Remembering that those things that took you down, knocked you down, got you off your feet and were struggles, but how you overcame them. And remembering that you overcame them, I mean, that gives us hope and courage to keep going, to keep pressing forward. See, gratitude shifts our perspective from problems to possibilities. From not there yet, but to look how far I've already come. See, when we exemplify gratitude it becomes our default setting gratitude is when i give glory and honor to god gratitude is that outpouring of respect and thankfulness to my heavenly father and i think for most of us if we're honest we don't always exemplify maybe an attitude or a characteristic of gratitude then I don't know about the rest of you this morning, but did you wake up and walk outside and go, oh, it's a little chilly in the air. God, thank you for the 14 minutes of fall we get today. <laughs> right? I mean, it caught me off guard. 
I forgot for 14 seconds that Florida actually can have the thermostat go below 90 outside. And then as I looked around, I saw one of the most beautiful sunrises this morning. I don't know if any of you guys were up that early. The 8.30 crowd was, but I don't know about the rest of you. But, but we, I saw that sunrise this morning. It was so pretty, I actually pulled over on the side of the road, and I took a couple pictures of it. And I looked up, and I'm like, wow, God, you did awesome today. All those colors rock on. That's beautiful. Thank you for the eyesight to see that, for the ability to feel that cool breeze. God, just thank you for this morning. That's what gratitude is. It's that you're grateful. Like gratitude that, man, I got out of bed this morning. And I know someone's like, yeah, but I had a pain. Yeah, but you got up. Oh, man, I put my foot down this morning. Oh, my heel hurts a little bit. But you had a heel to put pain on and pressure. Right? Like, like we could do whatever it is. But, but, man, it's that idea of gratitude where I'm thanking God for how far I've come. Because most of us, We've got a story to tell. We got scars to show, right? We got some things that we shouldn't even be here, but yet we are. Why? Because of the grace of God. And as the church, we should be the people overflowing with gratitude in the world. We are the people that God has entrusted to help shift the perspective of those around us. Instead of comparing and considering what we don't have, it's being content and grateful for what we do have. Do you remember where you've come from and how far God has brought you? My kids think I'm crazy when I tell them stories about what it meant to grow up poor and how when I was younger, all we had was powdered milk. And they were like, well, what did you add to it to get the milk? Did you add milk to it? And some of you right now, you have no idea. You're about to Google this thing. Ask Siri, what is powdered milk? It was called Alba. My poor people in the house, right? Yeah. Now I go to the store yesterday to buy milk. There's 98 varieties and half of it's not even from a cow. Bro, these are great times we're living in. Didn't see a box of Alba anywhere in the store. But you laugh, and I'd laugh. But do you remember where you came from? When was the last time you thanked God that you're not there anymore? We think about as the church, we have so much to be grateful for as a people. When was the last time we came to God with just gratitude instead of a laundry list of, but could you work on this? God, could you fix this? God, could you address that? And God's over here saying, you're welcome for breath today. Amen. How's that eyesight? How's that stint working out for you? And that second lease on life? How's that miraculous healing for that diagnosis for your child when you used to cry begging me to heal them and now they're graduating high school this year? Where's the gratitude? We're the people that have the most to be grateful for because God has done all that and saved our soul. So let it flow from us. The second thing that I think should be a distinctive that should mark the church is that we would be positive in our words and our deeds. That we as a people would be positive in our words and our deeds. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 says it this way. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about such things. Why? Because if I think about it, that's what I'm going to speak about. And if we're honest, the world doesn't need any more negative, cynical, downer type people. There's enough negative Nancys and downer Debbies, right? We don't need any more of that. And as people of God, he has called us to be different, to live different, to think and to speak life into ourselves, into our spouses, into our children, into each other. 
I promise you, there is not a time on this planet when your spouse says, could you be more critical of what I haven't done right in our relationship? I promise you, no spouse wakes up today saying, please, baby, make a list and tell me all the ways I have disappointed you and failed you today. Good morning. There is never a time where your child is going to say, you know what I remember most, Dad? How negative and critical you were to me. Thanks so much. They're never going to say that. Why? Because God is saying the simple truth that he's been saying for thousands of years. I often tell my children this. I said the Bible says that out of the overflow of your heart, the mouth speaks. And if we are the church, should we not be the most positive, encouraging, uplifting people on the planet? Because that's what our God does. He speaks life into and over us. And we have that same opportunity, that same privilege to speak life. But so often as people, we just focus on the negative. And that's true. Like I, I could go home today, and you know what I'm not going to remember? I'm not going to remember the 15 people who told me how good my shirt looks. No, I'm going to remember the one person who says, man, I've seen you look better, Pastor Paul. <laughs> and I'm going to be like, what do you mean? Bro, I like this shirt. Look, it's got those buttons, the pearl ones that snap. These are so cool. And I'm, I'm going to totally forget about the 15 people who said, that's a nice shirt. That looks really good. Oh, where'd you get that? I want one like that, right? No, I'm going to remember Bobby. Thanks, Bobby. You told me I've looked better. Because there is something innate that clings to negativity in humanity. But we have been called to lean in and speak out of our divinity, our divine nature, to speak life. I mean, when was the last time you left a positive Yelp review about something? I'm telling you, like, we do it, we see it all the time. Listen, if you come to Crosspoint looking for something wrong, I promise you, you'll find it. 100%. You'll find it. Why? You'll always find what you're looking for. But if you come looking for something positive, I promise you this, you'll find it. The choice is yours. The choice is yours. And when we get to things like social media, I remember I was talking to one of our staff members and they just started really posting more on social media and, and really wanting to be a force of positivity out there. And I'm like, that's awesome. Because that's my motto is that if it's going to show up in your feed, I want it to make you feel better, not worse. But yet how many times do we just focus on the negative? How many times are we putting each other down? How many times are we being critical and cynical? And it doesn't stop there. It becomes an infection within the church. It becomes divisive. It becomes gossip. It becomes slander. And it becomes everything opposite of what God intended his church, his people to be. He wants us to be positive, to speak life, to speak encouragement. He wants our own minds to be renewed by dwelling on the positive, the true, the righteous, the pure. There's enough junk in this world. Don't contaminate your brain, your mind, your heart, and your soul with it. And if you've got a mouth, use it to lift others up and not tear them down. There's enough toxicity in this world. You don't need to add to that chorus. Be a soloist and stand out and sing a different song of positivity and hope. Be the church. Let us radiate words of life. And then our last B statement of what I believe should distinguish us as the church is to be hopeful because the best is yet to come. To be hopeful because the best is yet to come. We have a hope, an undeniable hope of what God has done. The scriptures tell us in 1 Peter 3, 15, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that you have. When's the last time somebody asked you the reason for the hope that you have? And if it takes a little while to think about it, maybe tell your face to start reflecting that hope. You have a reason to smile. You have a reason to live 
You have a reason to be full of joy. You have a hope. And the Bible tells me I must be prepared to give that answer for my hope. And then I love that the last part of that verse is just kind of a nice reminder. And do this with gentleness and respect. Why? Because sometimes as Christ followers, we have a habit of sharing the hope of Jesus as a hammer instead of a hand up to people. We come across sometimes very harshly with the good news of Jesus instead of coming across very graciously with the good news of Jesus. You see, we speak and we testify to what God has done and is going to do. We share our faith with others and we share our hope in God that if God could do this in my life, he can do it in your life. And it doesn't mean that life is perfect. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be problems. But it means that as the church, we stand apart. We strive to be better. We seek out that difference of being grateful, of being positive, and of being hopeful. You know, over the last 18 years, I am blown away, humbled at the moment that I get to see before us now of what God has done, impacting and changing so many lives. And I remember 18 years ago, gathering in my living room with 10 people, and we had no clue what we were going to do. Not much has changed in 18 years. <laughs> I mean, all we knew is this. God called us to step out of our comfort zone. God called us to do something that we had not seen being done. God called us to be a place where gratitude, where encouragement, where joy, where blessing was front and center. A place where we give glory and honor and praise to him for what he has done and where we are so glad that you came today. And that hasn't changed in 18 years. And there were some good days and there were some bad days. There were some crushing moments and there were some exciting moments. There were some days where I was so defeated and I was so discouraged that I wanted to quit. And there were days where I was like, God, give us another mountain to take. You know the thing that kept me going in all of those days, in the good days and the bad days, in the, the highs and the lows, in the mountaintops and the valleys, was that I have a God who never quit on me. I have a God that when things were tough, that he carried his own cross to the crucifixion. And the Bible says that when he fell down, he got back up and kept carrying his cross. Because he knew what was on the other side of the cross was a resurrection and a salvation for my soul and yours. And so he kept going. And so in that moment, that perspective that he had, I'm sure it was miserable. I'm sure it was painful. But I never had to carry a cross for the sins of the world. So maybe what I got to carry, I can just get back up and keep going. And maybe though I've been knocked down, I can stand back up. And if I can't walk, then I can crawl. And I can keep going because I am blessed. And I have a hope that transcends circumstances, situations, diagnosis, and defeat. I have a hope in a Savior who will know my name and will call it one day to come home to eternity. And it is a hope that the world around us is desperate for. They are dying trying everything imaginable to fill the void in their life that God has already filled in our lives. And they're just asking. They're begging and they're pleading for the church to be the church, to be a beacon of hope and light to them. I wrote it down this way. Let us be the church as God intended it, marked by the working of his Holy Spirit, shining as a beacon of love and hope for the whole world to see. Now, you don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to understand all there is. What you have to do is allow God to begin to transform you and change you from the inside out. To begin to remake your thoughts and your words. 
to speak life and encouragement to one another, to yourselves, to your brothers and sisters of faith. To look for the positive and the things that you can praise that are worthy of praise in the lives of those around you. To call out in them the best that could be. The world will walk around with the report card. Let us walk around with a megaphone of praise and encouragement. Let us be the church that offers hope. Let us be a church where all are welcome and not judged by what they wore when they walked in. Let, let us be a place where ordinary people have an extraordinary encounter with Jesus. Let us be a people who are not content with that just happening in a building on Sunday, but who are passionate about living it out Monday through Saturday. Let us be the people who when we walk out these doors, we bring that message of hope across the dining room table and across the street to our neighbor and across the classroom to our t classmates and the cubicle to our coworkers. Let us be a people that it is so evident that when people see us, they see something different and they ask you, why do you have this hope? And our response is Jesus. It's Jesus. And what Jesus has done for me, he can do for you. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And for the last 18 years, we've had the privilege of saying, it's Jesus. And I look forward to the next 18 with hope and joy and excitement, saying, God, what else do you have in store? Because I am hopeful that the best is yet to come. It's Jesus. And maybe for some of you here this morning, the great truth of God is that he's been speaking to you and letting you know what's missing in your life is Jesus. That what he wants to do is to change and transform you through his grace and mercy shed through Christ's blood on the cross. See, I, I don't stand in a place of hope because of what I've done, because of my accomplishments. I stand in a place of hope because of what he has done for me. The Bible tells me left on my own, I'm going to make mistakes, I'm going to blow it, I'm going to sin. But in spite of my sins, my mistakes, and my shortcomings, God's grace is greater. But the greatness of God is that he does not force that upon me or you. He gives us the free will to choose to receive and accept it. And today my hope and my prayer is that as the Holy Spirit is impressing upon you, the need to accept it is that you would respond that you would put your faith in Christ. That as the Bible says, that when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Not by works, not by your own efforts, but by the grace of God poured out on the cross. And if that's you today, I want to give you that opportunity. I'm going to ask that everybody would bow their heads and close their eyes. And in the sincerity of this moment, if the Holy Spirit is impressing upon you that today is your day for salvation, that if you don't know for sure, if you don't have an absolute certainty, that if you were to stand before God, that you could say, God, I am not worthy, but I am covered in the blood of Jesus. And that is what assures my eternity in paradise with you. If you want that assurance and that certainty, then you invite Christ now to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Pray with me that prayer of invitation and salvation as I pray out loud. Dear Jesus, here I am. And I surrender my life to you, all that I was, all that I am, all that I will ever be. I believe in my heart and I am confessing with my mouth that Jesus, you are Lord. And you died to set me free from sin. Not just here on earth through grace and forgiveness, but for all eternity. And I am placing my hope firmly and wholly on you. On the power of your word and your life, your death and your resurrection. And upon this confession of faith, fill me now with the fullness of your Holy Spirit. For all honor and all glory is yours. So am I for all eternity. I'm yours. And I pray this in the powerful name 
of Jesus. Amen and amen. And if you prayed that prayer this morning, would you pull out a connect card that's in the seat back in front of you that my friend Sherry talked about? Go ahead and pull it out. It's okay. Don't worry about the person next to you. If you're surrendering your life to Christ, let us know so that we can come alongside you, so that we can help you get connected and grow in your faith. And then you can take that Connect card and you can drop it in the offering boxes on your way out today. Because we just want to help you on your faith journey to grow to the fullness of all that God has in store for you, to be your church. The second next step says, I will be. What's one of those areas today that we talked about? that you need to be more of in order to be the church? Is it gratitude? Do you need to be more grateful for what God has given you? Do you need to be reminded and encouraged of the blessings that he's poured out on you? Is it to be more positive in your words and your deeds? To speak life and encouragement to your family, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, your classmates, and your teammates? Is it to lift up your spouse and your children to speak life into the lost and the broken and the dead of this world. Maybe it's to be hopeful that regardless of where you have been, look where you are. And you might not be where you are, but look how far you've already come, that we have a hope in a Savior who has for us an eternal paradise. But even in the midst of this life, promises to walk with us through our valleys as he leads us to our mountaintops. We have a hope and his name is Jesus. What's that next step? And as you contemplate that, I want to tell you about some other opportunities just to connect here at Crosspoint. And one of them is our discovery class. That's happening this Wednesday at 6.15. And discovery class is, is our membership class. It's where we share the heartbeat of Crosspoint how we got here over the last 18 years, what God is doing, and how do we partner together to minister and to serve our community and to share the good news of Jesus. And if you consider Crosspoint your home and this is a place that you love and we're your family, then come be a part of this. Come hear a little bit more about it. We'll have free childcare. You can sign up by scanning that QR code. And we'd love, and I would love, just to get to know you, connect, and share a little bit more about our story and how your story and our story now intertwines and becomes one story of God working together in us and through us to make a difference here in our community. Our fourth next step is fight night. And I want to give you an opportunity, gentlemen, to sign up and be a part of this. Let's check out that trailer video for what's in store for us this Friday night. I'm going to tell you three things that I think you have to master if you're going to be a great leader. You've got to master yourself. Master your support. And then the last thing you need to be able to master is sacrifice. I'll tell you a little bit about how I ended up in the U.S. Army and how I ended up in Mogadishu, Somalia, getting shot at and taking part in the events of Black Hawk Down. I think many people think, oh, Jeff got shot at and he got scared and, and he's different because of it. And really that wasn't it. Been in firefights and previous combat um, tours before this. You be honest with yourself for just a second. Are you the kind of guy who's going through life just simply looking for comfort and looking for convenience? Every time it gets hard, you're running for the escape. Because if that's the way you're living your life, you will never become the warrior that God has created you. Every fiber of my being was saying, no, Jeff, don't do this. This is crazy. It's suicide. You're going to get yourself killed if you go back out there. I mean, God is sending us to go out and to impact the world for King Jesus. In fact, the Holy Spirit punched me in the face at this instant and helped me realize, Jeff, your job as a Christian soldier is not just to prepare warriors to meet the enemy. It's to prepare them for eternity. It's going to be a powerful, powerful night. And I want to encourage you, if you're a senior in high school all the way to a senior citizen, guys, be here with us. This is an opportunity, and the reason we're bringing in Jeff as a guest speaker is that sometimes, guys, we have a hard time opening up or relating to people. We're like, yeah, but you don't know what I've been through. You don't know where I've been. Especially if you got guys that are 
friends and buddies that are veterans, maybe people that are first responders, man, they see some tough stuff and they have a hard time wrapping what they see or what they experienced around the truth of faith. And when you get a guy like Jeff to come in here and share his story, his testimony of how in the midst of some of the harshest, worst things, God was present and his grace abounded. It will connect and it will open doors and it will bring down walls and it will change lives. And so I want to invite you, I want to encourage you, men, be here. Sign up and be a part of it. I know you're like last minute, like, oh, I'll see what I'm doing on Friday. Make a commitment. And don't just come by yourself. Bring some buddies. Bring some coworkers. Seniors in high school, bring your teammates. Bring some guys that will connect and resonate that God has laid on your heart. And our theme for this Friday night is to fight for your brother and leave no man behind. Because that is the kind of faith that God calls us to have. And that's why we exist as a church, is to leave no one behind. And so I want to encourage you, I'm looking forward to this Friday. We've been praying and preparing literally for months, for months for this night to be a powerful night of life change an impact for the kingdom of God, for the men of our community. Men, bring your brothers. Bring your co-workers. Bring your neighbors and friends. And let's see what Jesus does in their life. And then our last next step is to memorize 1 Peter 3.15. And it was our verse that we ended our teaching with. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Man, what great truth to anchor into my heart, my mind, and my soul to remind me that I do have a hope and there is a world so desperate for it, they will ask me, why? Why can you have hope? Why in the midst of this situation or this circumstance do you have a hope? And then it is my privilege to tell them the story of what Jesus has done for me. So let us go forth this week and be the church as God intended us to be hope to the world around us. It's been an honor and a privilege to share this message with you. And if you're new here, I'd love to meet you after the service in our first time guest lounge. And I look forward to all that God has in store for us as we celebrate what he's going to do the next 18 years. God bless you and let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the privilege to serve and to lead here. Thank you for the privilege to serve alongside so many amazing men and women. Father, thank you for my family. Thank you for my wife and my children. Thank you for the blessings that are beyond anything I could deserve. And I pray, Father, that you give us the privilege for 18 more years at least to be empowered and indwelled by your Holy Spirit to share the good news of Jesus. All honor, all glory, and all praise is yours. In Jesus' name we pray.